Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this special webinar, a conversation with the 2021 Innovations in Alzheimer's Caregiving Award winners. I'm Calvin Hu with Family Caregiver Alliance. And before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about our organization. Uh, Family Caregiver Alliance has been working in the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being and the quality of life of family caregivers. We offer support by providing a number of services and resources, including consultations, classes, workshops, publications, and we do advocacy work both locally and nationally. To learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance, please visit us at caregiver.org. Uh, finally, so all of us online have a better idea of who's participating today, I'd like to get a quick poll up. Now I'd like to turn things over to our host, FCA Director of Operations and Planning, Leah Eskenazi. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are so glad that you've joined us today. Um, we invite you to become part of the conversation. So ask questions, um, share your comments at any time during the webinar. Uh, you can do this by uh, using the Q&A or the chat function uh, located at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, I'd like to give you just a little background on the awards. We're grateful to the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation and to Bader Philanthropies for their very generous support. Family Caregiver Alliance joins them in promoting these awards um, with the goal to raise awareness of community programs delivering important work every day in their local areas, and two, to highlight organizations working hard to improve the lives of family caregivers and those living with Alzheimer's disease and related conditions. The funding organizations do have a very deep and personal connection with Alzheimer's disease. And through these awards and, and their other efforts, they seek to improve the health and wellness of those families, friends, and partners who are living with Alzheimer's and related dementias. Um, we receive about 80 applicants, um, applications per year for the Innovations in Alzheimer's Caregiving Awards um, from across the United States. And uh, we are just always in awe by the array of, um, of um, uh, applications that we do receive and the cool programs that are out there. Um, the, what we look for in the community programs are those who are delivering any innovative and meaningful services. And we invite you to apply to, uh, to us in one of the three categories, creative expression, diversity, uh, multicultural communities, and public policy. Um, selected awardees, as you may already know, receive a $20,000 uh, award to acknowledge the important work that they have already accomplished. So let's move uh, to the main reason that you're joining us today, to hear about the work of this year's awardees and to engage in a discussion with them. Um, the, our, uh, let me just tell you who our awardees are. Uh, they are uh, for the uh, creative expression, arts is in, uh, Tessa Garcia McEwen uh, with uh, the Memory Center at University of Chicago, and Fabiana Glazer, who's the Executive Director of Gold Mind Arts and Aging. Um, for uh, Elderwise, also in the Creative Expression category, uh, Sandy Saberski, uh, who is a founder of Elderwise. And in the Diverse Multicultural category, uh, we will have Sheila Williams, Program Director, and Katie Hine, um, also a director for CARE New York, CARE NYC, uh, which is part of the Sunnyside Community Services. So let's get started right now uh, with Art is In. Um, take it away. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you. So good to be here. I'm Tessa Garcia McEwen. I'm the licensed clinical social worker of the Memory Center here at UChicago Medicine. And I'm honored to be part of the interdisciplinary care team where we follow our patients care journey along with their family members from diagnosis and beyond. We're thrilled to be the recipient of this year's innovations in Alzheimer's caregiving award. I'd like to first start with a brief overview of the Memory Center at UChicago Medicine. We're uniquely placed on the south side of Chicago where some of the greatest disparities in healthcare exist. We treat the most vulnerable and marginalized populations including residents of the south side of Chicago, those with rare neurological conditions, and the younger onset Alzheimer's population and all diagnoses related to memory loss and dementia. At the Memory Center, our program model prioritizes the patient and the caregiver. So we provide person-centered care from the time we spend in the diagnostic workup to the ongoing tailored care planning for each patient, their family, and support team. And in addition, we have, we have extensive community partnerships with dementia-friendly organizations in Chicago and recommend high-quality programming and resources for our patients and caregivers to access. Our creative artisan program Celebrating its 10th year with Goldmind Arts is a professionally curated art experience for those with memory loss and their care partners. I'd like to introduce the creator and founder of the program, Fabiana Goodman. You can display the next Hi. one. Sorry, Tessa. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here and I would love to describe the program. Art is In is a technology free, professionally curated, eight week art at home free program that aims to engage and encourage meaningful creative expression for caregivers and individuals living with dementia who cannot participate in virtual activities or those with limited access or ability to use a computer or internet. Here you can see everything that comes in week one. You can open it up, sit down and get started. To date, Art Is In has distributed distributed over 2,000 art kits to individuals with dementia and their caregivers of diverse backgrounds in partnership with the Memory Center at the University of Chicago Medicine. Next slide. So you can see the kit over here. Oh, sorry. Everything that they receive in the mail kit. Next slide. So medical research over the last several years has provided strong evidence that lifestyle modifications can help to delay the onset or the progression of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Particularly important is to maintain social engagement and reduce stress. The weekly art kit contains two images focusing on dementia related topics and discussion points that allow caregivers and patients to share stories, celebrate long-term memories and strengthen their relationships. The, ki the kits contain art materials and a sophisticated but simple art making project to do at home. The curated art and intentional discussion prompts are directly connected to enhancing aspects of activities of daily living, such as sleep and nutrition, providing an opportunity for social interaction. Next slide. For example, one caregiver said, these weekly art kits bring out a side of him we never get to see. They're unlike anything else we do. Another caregiver expressed, my husband is really enjoying these projects and they are making him laugh more than he has in a long time. In addition, the tech-free nature and at-home elements overcome hurdles and transcend existing barriers for participation that are well known to our patient population. Apart from receiving an art kit, participants also receive a check-in call from a student volunteer. The art program reaches multiple generations with grandchildren and grandparents connecting through the art exercises. Next slide, please. The program benefits both the patient and the caregiver. Caregivers have reported reduced stress, decreased feelings of isolation and loneliness, improved self-worth, elevated mood, greater cooperation, and have appreciated the engaging and stimulating art activities, which are helping to reduce cognitive decline. This is highlighted by a recent testimonial from a caregiver. Next slide. As a caregiver, the biggest gift to me from this program is the gift of quality time and discovering something new with my mom. The weekly activities were an opportunity to create new experiences in the face of a devastating disease that has rocked our family. I did not expect it at the time, but the weekly art projects also became therapeutic for me as well. 
an outlet that has been so critical to sustaining my ability to be an active and present caretaker with my mom. We are looking forward to the continuation of this program. Next slide, please. Here at the Memory Center, we are recognizing that caregiving can be both challenging and rewarding. The Art is In program provides a meaningful opportunity for the caregiver and the patient to connect. It provides shared moments of relief, quality conversation, and joy. We would like to thank the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation, Beta Philanthropies, Inc., and Family Caregiver Alliance for recognizing Art is In for the 2021 Innovations in Alzheimer's Caregiving Award. We are committed to growing and expanding the program to reach as many patients and caregivers as possible with the goal of improving quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tessa and Fabiana. And my apologies, Fabiana, I changed your last name on you and you didn't even know it. So <laughs> it's okay. Fabiana Goodman. It um, was my maiden name. It's <laughs> thank you so much. Um, let's, uh, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, let's move on to Elderwise, Sandy. Thank you so much for joining us, Sandy. I know that um, Annie couldn't make it today and we so appreciate you being able to, to um, uh, present for Elderwise. Oh, Sandy, you're on mute. <laughs> there you go, perfect. <laughs> no worries. I also want to echo my heartfelt thank you to the Family Caregiver Alliance to the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation and to Bader Philanthropies for making it possible for us to be here today. We are also thrilled. This is an era of creativity and expansion in the care of persons living with dementia. At Elderwise, we're grateful to have the opportunity to be engaged in this work. One, to make life meaningful and expansive for persons living with dementia. And two, to give tools to caregivers to ease their work and to find moments of joy in their days. Elderwise is special because of its philosophy. We believe that people are whole despite their cognitive losses. The essence of who we are does not change. Everything we do revolves around this philosophy, our adult day program, our outreach programs, our online programs, and our community teaching and educational programs. We support the whole person and raise awareness of their joys and abilities. We help to create a social community to which a person with memory loss can belong. We aim to stimulate all aspects of who we are in body, through exercise, breathing, and good food, through the mind, with important discussion groups where everyone has an opportunity to listen and to share, through artistic work with expression and creativity, and through spirit with the opportunity to give to others through quiet moments and through ritual. When we started Elderwise 25 years ago, we had the hypothesis that people with dementia can grow and learn, that they can become more open, more tolerant, more willing to try new things, and more joyful. Now we have the confidence to say this is true. Instead of becoming more closed and isolated, as is a natural tendency with loss of function, with the Elderwise philosophy, one can shift this to an experience of more openness, whether it's in one's own home with a caregiver team or, excuse me, or at one of our programs. I would like to share a story of the journey of Patty and Sally through Elderwise. <clears throat> Patty was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Being in the health field herself, Patty was aware of her cognitive changes. She told her partner, I want to be a part of a community of others that are, have similar challenges. I want a dementia community. Patty began attending our day program. Though a bit quiet and shy, she opened up 
when given the space and time to get her thoughts out and share. There were unspoken connections too, exchanging admiration of paintings with other members of the group and enjoying tea and peanut butter toast. Patty loved the painting and sometimes began painting even before the brushes were passed out. It was for her another way, perhaps an easier way for her to express her feelings. She created something that was appreciated by others. The quiet that happens during painting allows a person that deep focused concentration that someone with dementia may not find that often. Patty's partner, Sally, bought a copy of our book for all the members of their care team so that they could create the Elderwise way at home. The rhythms of the day, the deep listening, slowing down time, and finding joy in the present. When the day program closed due to COVID, Patty and Sally and their caregiver, Anne, attended our online weekly art program. They all slowed down, painted together, and shared in this supportive community. Presently, we are excited to have become, begun our in-person day program again at, as a collaborating member of the Memory Hub a place for dementia-friendly community collaboration and impact. It is operated by the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center on the campus of founding partner, the Fry Art Museum. We have had seven master's students seeking internships with us, and we look forward to further developing our internship program. Building on the publication of our book, The Elderwise Way, A Different Approach to Life with Dementia, and to be able to share Elderwise spirit-centered care with more people, Elderwise is developing an online training program for caregivers. The first of many planned educational courses is completed and will be available July 1st, accessible through our website. It is an overview of our philosophy of spirit-centered care. To recap, Elderwise spirit-centered care includes working from your own essence, recognizing the essence of others, maintaining a sense of equality, which means understanding that our physical or cognitive function can change at a moment's notice and doesn't define our value. Appreciating the wholeness of each person, following daily rhythms, practicing deep listening, slowing down time, and finding joy in the present. We look forward to more workshops and presentations for family and professional caregivers in the future. As one staff member put it, Elderwise is a testimony to the human spirit, to the joy and sense of community, that are inherent in us as human beings, regardless of age or personal challenges. This is a gathering of people that society today tends to underestimate, undervalue and marginalized. And here recognized and respected, they thrive. So much so that visitors always want to linger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, very much appreciate all that beautiful artwork. I would like now to introduce um, CARE NYC, Sheila and Katie, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, my name is Katie Hine and Sheila Williams and I are here on behalf of Sunnyside Community Services a social service settlement house in Queens, New York City. We would like to thank the Family Caregiver Alliance, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation and Bader Philanthropies for this award and for our program, to our program, Karen YC, for serving diverse multicultural communities. Sunnyside serves people of all ages from preschoolers through an older adults with free culturally appropriate programming that is particularly relevant to our large Latinx community. 
Our youth and family programs provide pre-K through college readiness. We support immigrants and low-income adults with our home care training, ESOL classes, and community advocacy and engagement. Our programs for older adults include support to the homebound through case management, meal delivery, and friendly visiting that matches them with a friend to help combat social isolation. Our Center for Older Active Adults engages people with activities and provides meals. Our mental health counseling provides needed emotional support. And our Care NYC Caregiver Program provides the support to people caring for a family member or friend, particularly those caring for someone with Alzheimer's or other dementia. Sheila will tell you more about the specific services we provide caregivers, but first we'll share a brief video so you can see firsthand what our clients experience at Sunnyside. This is something we created to help outreach to our Latinx community. So it is in Spanish with English subtitles. Algo que encontramos que es muy beneficioso para los cuidadores es reunirse con otras personas que estén pasando por lo mismo. Los que no vinieron ayer, Mi esposa tiene demencia y al mismo tiempo que la estoy cuidando a ella, estoy aprendiendo cómo cuidarme yo mismo. Yo necesito mucho ir a ese grupo porque ahí comentamos todo lo que nos está pasando y ya también recibimos ayudas e ideas de cómo podemos solucionar algún tipo de problema que tengamos. Ofrecemos servicios para los cuidadores en los cinco condados. Y también ofrecemos la oportunidad que el ser querido venga al centro para participar en actividades. Nosotros trabajamos para usted. Para ayudarle en su idioma, en su comunidad y en sus necesidades. Estamos aquí para ayudarte a llenar un formulario y también llenarte de alegría. Lo que hace Sunnyside que sea un lugar único es que en un solo lugar pude encontrar todo. Pude encontrar el grupo de apoyo, pude encontrar la ayuda legal, pude encontrar un centro social y en español. Está todo ahí. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk a little bit about Care NYC and what we offer. Um, as Katie mentioned, we are in New York City, Queens to be specific. And Queens, New York is one of the most diverse communities in the world with nearly half of the population immigrating from outside the US and Spanish being the most spoken language after English. With a team of 16, we work to ensure our services are both culturally and linguistically responsive to the diverse communities we serve. We offer individual and family consultations, which provide emotional support and long-term planning. We also offer support groups, educational workshops, different activities that promote self-care, financial support, respite services, and assistance with assessing benefits. These services are designed to promote improve, conserve, and restore the mental and physical well-being of the caregivers, as well as improve the quality of life for those living with Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. During the pandemic, Queens was one of the hardest hit areas in the country. Higher rates of death, unemployment, and food insecurity hit the Latino, Latino community especially hard, which resulted in caregivers having an increased need for services. In 2021, we served over 2,000 caregivers and we provided over 3,000 consultations. The pandemic left many families living on fixed income or experiencing job loss struggling financially, which created additional stressors. Our program was able to offer over 19,000 hours of in-home care, which saved these families over $540,000 in out-of-pocket expenses. 
These respite services were a lifeline for many of these families. And in one instance, a caregiver was hospitalized due to COVID, leaving his wife living with Alzheimer's disease home alone. With no other supports, we were able to provide 24-hour in-home care with Spanish-speaking aides who made sure the client remained safe until the caregiver returned home. Having helped the family through the crisis, we continue to provide support through our continuum of care. And it's cases like this that highlight the critical work that our program and others um, are doing to support caregivers in need. Next slide. So again, we would like to thank the Family Caregiver Alliance, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation, and Bader Philanthropies for acknowledging the work that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila and Katie. Very, um, I'm so glad we got the sound to work because I love it. <laughs> we are <this>. too. <laughs> yeah, you know, just wonderful. Um, so now we're going to have, uh, imagine that we're now moving to uh, some comfortable chairs and we're going to have a conversation with uh, all of our presenters. And I'm going to ask a couple questions and then we're also going to ask any questions that you might have uh, that you've put in chat. Uh, or the Q&A. So please feel free, uh, any of those uh, of you who are joining us today to uh, submit your questions and we'd be happy to, uh, to uh, uh, respond to those. But let's start, um, I think we'll start with uh, Fabiana and Tessa, if you don't mind, um, with our first question, which is, um, will you share a problem or an issue that you sought to solve by offering your program to your community? Yes, um, I'll start and then Fabiana can chime in. Uh, basically, the, one of the most common pieces of feedback we receive in clinic is we have nothing to do at home. We're looking for more social engagement. And then of course, with the exacerbation of the uh, lockdown, behaviors increased and caregiver burden um, increased as well, and people could have less ability to transport or have um, the funding or even just the location, whether they're rural or, or local, it didn't matter. We were stuck, everyone was stuck at home. So there was a great need for increased social engagement at home and to fill in the service delivery gaps and reach across lines of accessibility. Yes, I, I have to agree with Tessa. I wish we could say that we knew what we were doing 100%. We had been an in-person program for eight and a half years um, and adapted to a remote version thanks to COVID. And the silver lining was that we found that participants who may have come to class in a non-COVID time really loved having activities to do at home and, of course, it's hard for anybody and everybody, but especially those living with memory loss to be in a certain place at a certain time, dressed, parked, fed, no snacks, close to the bathroom. It's just, it's hard to do every week. Um, so they really expressed an enormous amount of pleasure from getting kits at home and things to do at home. But we also found out that since we're using the mail and we're not using screens, that we really opened up the program to people living as we mentioned in our presentation, in areas that aren't close to any programming, but also those who don't do so well with technology or don't want to do so well with technology. So our program, at least on the forward facing side for participants, um, really was able to include a lot more than we had even hoped for. So that was really it was a it was a real silver lining of COVID that we discovered that. Interesting how there is that silver lining of COVID, although it seemed at the beginning of all of it that it was just going to be devastating. Um, so it's great that uh, I think all of our programs here, um, to use a maybe an overused word, pivoted uh, uh, in, a, in a pretty major way. Um, Sandy, would you talk a little bit about ElderWise and, and you know, what the problem was or issue was that you sought to, to solve? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Great. So sorry. I appreciated what uh, Fabiana said about not knowing exactly what we're doing. That makes me more comfortable to say that too. Uh, but um, when we first started, it is, it's like a big social experiment. We've been, Elderwise started 25 years ago. 
And the problem we wanted to solve, the first problem was just um, undervaluing of people with dementia. And then with time, the second problem we wanted to solve was the extreme stress of caregiving. We wanted to change the culture of how society views people with dementia. And we hoped to make life more meaningful and expansive for them. And we wanted caregivers to have tools to help ease their work, to find moments of joy in their days and to understand the possibility of their own growth in their caregiver role. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Sheila and Katie, uh, same question. What were, what were you um, working to solve or the, the issue you sought to, to address? I think for us in general, even before the pandemic, you know, we noticed the need for caregivers to be engaged with each other, um, the connection through support groups or just learning about the services and connecting to us um, was already there. And then, you know, through this, you know, pandemic, it became so much more um, apparent and, and really exacerbated. So, you know, I would echo what Tessa was saying in the beginning about, you know, the social engagement part is really important. And also what Sandy was saying, um, I think that, you know, this created an opportunity as well, you know, through the through the virtual workshops and support groups that we are able to create. Um, I think also another part that has always been an important piece of our services is the real logistical and financial support that we can give our clients through respite um, or helping them with um, you know, some limited financial support um, related to caregiving issues. So um, that that's always been a big piece of it. And, you know, our Latino community is, you know, they have increased barriers to getting services already. And then during this pandemic, that that really became even more so. so um, and the, the needs increased. Um, so that that has, you know, those two pieces of it have been really important and of, for our programs all along the way, but even more now. Oh, Leah, you're muted. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Sheila, is there something you'd like to add to that? Sure. Well, um, I'm pretty much going to echo what everyone has, else has already said. Um, we recognize that a lot of our older adults were very isolated. And so we had to get creative on how we engage. So, of course, like everyone else, we pivoted to a virtual platform. Mm -hmm. And with that, there were some challenges, right, not only with our staff, but with our caregivers. A lot of them were not um, tech savvy. And mm -hmm. so we had to educate them and ourselves on using this platform. Um, but we also use it as an opportunity to get creative with what we offered. Uh, before the pandemic, everything was in person. So the different activities like the art and the music was in person, but we had to uh, start offering those type of things virtually. So um, we started an art club and a music club and a book club and those type of things. So, uh, you know, for us, we really had to be strategic because our goal was to engage our caregivers and to ensure that they had the support that they needed. Excellent. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, uh, Katie. Excellent. Um, so I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna actually turn right back to Katie and Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> so why we don't go on the same rotation? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and let's uh, let me ask you, what discoveries did you make along the way as you developed the program, or or that you've learned about the uh, you know along the ways, um, and including sort of what barriers you faced and maybe what unexpected uh, opportunities did you uncover? Maybe sure. could you talk about that a little bit? That'd be great. Absolutely. So one of the most popular services that we offer is respite service, right? So we're mm -hmm. providing in-home care, or we will pay for um, a client to go to an adult day service, I mean, adult day center. Um, but of course, during the pandemic, all of that was shut down. 
And so because of the increased need, caregivers became more stressed. They didn't have the family support that they normally had because COVID was in place. No one was visiting. You didn't want anyone in your home. And so we had to really work with home care agencies. We had to work with our caregivers to ensure everyone's safety. And as caregivers were being more open to receiving that type of help, we ran across the problem. Now we have a shortage in home health aides. And, uh, and because we uh, target the Latino community, there was an additional shortage of Spanish speaking aides. And so that was something that we really struggled with um, during, especially during the height of the pandemic, you know, we contracted with a number of new agencies just so we could try to get more coverage and more aids into the home. Um, Medicaid, a lot of clients use our Medicaid, I mean, our respite services as a bridge for Medicaid. And so Medicaid was backlogged. It was months before people were actually getting approved for Medicaid. And our services are limited, you know, so it was we had to find a balance to be able to continue to provide the support to them, um, but also standing, staying within our program guidelines, you know, per our funder. So that was probably one of the, the things that we learned and one of the barriers that we face. Um, outreach, we depend a lot on outreach. Um, and of course, with everything shut down, we had to make these connections virtually. Um, and mm -hmm. like, us, other organizations were going through those changes, right? No one was really using the virtual platforms to connect. And so, um, you know, I think it was just a lot of organizations coming together to ensure that we were able to support our caregivers. I like that um, uh, you really, you had to be strategic early on and quickly at the beginning mm -hmm. of COVID, didn't you? And you couldn't Absolutely. just... Uh, stop you had to like jump right in and say okay how are we going to deal with this and Absolutely. we've got this great program but where do we where do how do we take it in a new way correct uh, and and uh, as 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 fabiana said and and sandy echoed uh, you kind of had to um guess as you went right absolutely <laughs> <laughs> we had to figure it out yeah had to figure it out katie is there anything you wanted to add to that um Actually, I, I wanted to, I'm because I'm realizing, you know, people are uh, participating from all over the country and the Medicaid home care services are really different state to state. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to clarify that in New York State, there is, there has been um, a really good um, program that makes it easier for people who have um, in, income that maybe just gets them over what would normally be allowed for Medicaid coverage long-term to get home care in place. Um, so that's something that, you know, we have always been working with our clients to try and help them understand the process to apply for Medicaid home care and, um, and providing the respite, as Sheila said, as a bridge until that starts. But of course, you know, there's, there's state funding changes now and, and new guidelines that are always putting up new barriers to that long-term service now too. So, you know, that's something that we have to work against as well. But um, yeah, so thank you. I just wanted to clarify that if people yeah. had questions. That actually, I, I'm glad you did, Katie, uh, uh, just because we receive calls from caregivers from across the nation. One of the number one questions uh, often is, you know, how can I get paid to be a caregiver? Uh, which is often, you know, Medicaid is one of those few ways, but every state is different and Medicaid is not Medicare, right? Medicaid is a whole different uh, uh, source. So uh, there's a lot of education uh, that's, uh, that's uh, 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 kind of unclear about the two. So that's great that also that there's a program uh, to help bridge in New York. Um, uh, let me uh, ask Sandy, uh, did I... Uh, yeah, let me ask Sandy the same question. What discoveries did you make along the way as you developed your program? And you were a founder of the program, right, Sandy? Yeah. Co-founder. Yeah, co-founder. Okay. Uh, barriers and unexpected opportunities? Sure. Well, you know, it, it's been a long journey. So I think um, I will stick to how we shifted in COVID uh, times, um, which, you know, we were left with, we had a day program and what were we going to do? And so our program is for people with memory loss. And 
What we did was the people that were currently in our day program, we met with them and their care partners on weekly online. So what, what we learned about that is what we developed was a relationship with the care partners, which we never really, our, our primary relationship was with the person with dementia. So suddenly we had a deeper relationship with the person with memory loss. And in addition, we realized it was our support group as well. Um, so that was, we carried that group through almost the entire time um, of, the, of the lockdown. And um, we, in addition to that, we started two other online groups. One was, and I really appreciate non-tech, believe me, but we, we were able to manage a tech version, an online version of the art um, program. So we had an art program that was, for, we called it ArtWise. And then we had a conversation program because conversation and listening is a big part of our program too with people with dementia. So it's mo that these program the the conversation program programs where people were for people with dementia and if they needed support from somebody they were there but they were the primary person. Um, we also took the time um, to develop our education program. You know, I don't know that we would have really taken the time and had the ability to spend that much time on, on developing our education program. And so we're really excited to launch that, you know, that program based on our book. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Fabiana and Tessa, um, again, what discoveries did you make along the way? Um, barriers that you faced and unexpected opportunities did you uncover? Oh, gosh, I think probably um, Art is In has forced us to become more tech savvy than I ever would have hoped to, on our end. So we really are, are very dedicated to keeping the participants end next to no tech. We, we use telephone calls for support and we really, everything goes through the, I also know way too much about the mail service now. If anyone has any questions about parcel rates. Um, so that we really were dedicated to keeping very low tech, but on our end, it went the other way because we also needed to stay very COVID safe. Everyone was receiving these packages at home and therefore they stayed safe. But we had done on our end, needed to do a lot of, of work on campus. So that means packing up kits, um, inventory, uh, getting the kits shipped out, and then all of the students, the small student army of volunteers that makes our program possible, um, were really helpful in helping us set up a gazillion different software systems. I call them systems, which is not the right word for software, but there are systems to keep track of inventory, to make sure that students who go into a space know how to pack up a kit, um, and then getting all of those no tech and high tech systems to kind of intersect and work together. So um, it was a really steep learning curve. I am so proud of the work that we have done together because everyone has been incredibly safe. And at the same time, this machine, we are now serving 25 states. So the kits are going all out. Everyone's staying safe, more or less. It moves pretty smoothly. Um, and as an unintended benefit, I mean, thank goodness for the student volunteers. Without them, this program would not be possible. Hours and hours of, of people packing every day and sending kids out. It, it's the, the backbone of the program. But the unintended benefit, I have to say, is that these students are now exposed to a program like this. A lot of these students, if not all of these students, are um, pre-med or uh, in social work or uh, something adjacent to that, which is why they were interested in volunteering for the program. And so many of them are packing. So they're seeing the contents of these kits, but they're also doing the support calls. Um, and, and just so happy to see that last count, which was not done very recently, there was 137 student volunteers helping. And all of those students have now seen a program like this, which I think as you know, Family Caregivers Alliance has identified, these programs are not so visible. So they all got to have a front row seat at what these programs can do and how they work in a hospital uh, setting. And I just think that it's fabulous for them to go on throughout their careers and their educational careers with this experience behind them. Mm -hmm. 
And even just to echo that, you know, um, even from the program evaluation perspective, we started off with these postal mailed surveys because, you know, we're trying to keep it low tech, but then part of the pivoting, you know, it's, it's postal mail can be difficult. So we realized that we did need to do digital surveys to, to capture the program impact and the volunteers would capture the responses over the phone. So we problem solved through those things and um, we were able to use user-friendly URLs at the time in addition to the digital systems that Fabiano was describing. And in this past year, we've just received multiple awards and grant awards to continue to expand, grow and deepen um, this program. And we're very grateful for that. And we're even venturing off. We saw uh, a comment in the chat, like, are you doing this for music too? And what's up? And so we just wanna let you all know that we do have this arts-based version, um, but also we are venturing into music because one of our fellows um, and who is our new attending, Dr. Caitlin Seibert is a um, specialist in music and neurology. So we have her here <laughs> and we have just created a storytelling project as well, curated by Dr. Amelia Klein, who is a professor who has roots in um, archiving the stories of Holocaust survivors. And so she transformed her um, expertise into a storytelling project to capture the, um, the narratives of our patients um, in the memory center as well. So we're very honored and thankful. Excellent, thank you. It's so important to, to influence healthcare providers, uh, up and coming healthcare providers in, in all sorts of um, uh, the medical, allied health and human, human services, social workers and such who are gonna uh, do this work, um, makes a big difference. Excellent, thank you all. One uh, question, one more question and then we'll open it up to our, our uh, questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to ask you for just, let's say, three things. I know I'm limiting this a little bit, but we're a little tight on time. Um, what advice do you have to others who want to set off in a similar direction? If you were just to think about your three top points, um, what advice do you have for others who want to set on a, on a similar direction as you did with your program? Who would like to go first with that? Was that... Fabiana, did I see a hand? <laughs> you didn't, but nice. Oh, I did. <laughs> Sorry. Um, three is actually hard. I'm going to say that um, the advice that I have is to give you, it's a motto that I use for a lot of things in life, but I think it's very applicable here. This feels hard because it is hard. And to give yourself, we talked a lot about pivoting, which is again, a very, a huge buzzword in this pandemic, right? I, I think we really need to, we're figuring out for the next pandemic, we'll be primed, but we're figuring things out still in year 1 million of this pandemic, how to do it. And um, to give yourself a little bit of grace, because this is really, really, really hard. And also to try and connect. I mean, this, this webinar is giving me so much inspiration hearing about other programs. We all work so hard in our bubbles, especially now because of the pandemic, everyone is very isolated. Um, and then I'm also going to say to really, really listen to what participants say. I think that is the key to getting it right. And I think we have lots of ideas of what would make programs perfect and, and, and what people need, but really, we really need to listen to what participants say and to be able to serve their needs. Thank you. Any, uh, do you want a fourth, Tessa? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to give room for others. Really, uh, we, we were saying, find someone as motivated and passionate as Fabiana. <laughs> She's been <laughs> an excellent um, nice. creator of the program and, you know, explore working with a university community. There's such rich resources there and there's a robust desire to volunteer. So you can get a lot of assistance there and work with a multidisciplinary team. Great. Um, Sheila and Katie, I'm going to go ahead and, and call on you. And uh, uh, what, do you, what do you think? What are your top three? Sheila, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I would say recognizing caregivers have differing needs, just depending on where they are on their caregiving journey. So you need to be able to address that and respond with the support that they need. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say cultural competency mm -hmm. and also building trust. 
because we work with the Latino population, you have to build a trust and respect their culture. So those would be the top three things that I would say. Absolutely. Make it possible for them to be able to share uh, their their issues outside of their family um, so they can get support. Uh, Katie, any additions to that? Um, I would add a that it's important to um, leverage your partners, like take advantage of um, other organizations or programs at your own organization that can help support what you're doing. Um, so I, I mentioned at the top of our presentation about Sunnyside, you know, all of the different services that we provide there. And that's really been, you know, a huge support to our clients in addition to what we directly provide them through the caregiver program. So we have, you know, people, um, we have an immigration services program that can really, you know, help them with grants and looking at other options um, for them. We have, you know, a case management program that does meals on wheels and, you know, we can, you know, work with them to get other things in place for them. So I think that, you know, don't have tunnel vision about just what your program does, but look at, you know, the other needs that the caregiver has. And, you know, once you get those other supports in place too, you know, it's easier for them to deal with the caregiving issues. Great, thank you, perfect. And Sandy, um, what are your three? Yeah, I, I really appreciate everybody else's three. I think I'll just add, because our situation is slightly different. Um, it's, about our, it's about the philosophy and about shifting our, our, the way we see people with memory loss. So <clears throat> I just say, <clears throat> if you're interested in doing that, um, you can you know, look at the book or the education program and just take whatever resonates with you to your own program. It doesn't have to be starting a new program, but you can take pieces that feel right and at, use them in whatever program you are all currently um, use, uh, participating with now or at home. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn to Calvin um, with uh, some of the questions that we uh, have received in the chat and the Q and A. Uh, thanks Leah. Yeah, I think we have time for uh, a couple of questions. Um, Let's see, for the first one, we had a listener who wants to know from, I guess, uh, Fabiana and Tessa, is the, um, is the artist in a program just for patients at uh, University of Chicago School of Medicine? Is it open to residents of, you know, the Chicago area, the Illinois area? And if not, are there any plans to open it up to a wider audience? Yeah, so we actually serve um, anybody who is um, living with memory loss and their care partner. And I'm just going to grab, I think Tessa did answer it, but it can be done with different care partners every week um, if wanted, if needed. And we ship to not Alaska or Hawaii, nothing against them, but the shipping costs are too high. Uh, we ship to all the continental touching states. So you do not need to be a University of Chicago patient. Perfect. Thanks. We have a, another listener who wanted to know. This is a, um, a Sandy question, Elderwise. They want to know actually a little bit more about how the spirit centered care, I kind of how that works with uh, or how it is adapted for people in the various stages of dementia. Uh, thank you. Um, so spirit centered care is about a way of working with people where you work from your own essence and you recognize the essence of others. So it's that working from deep within and seeing that all people are whole. We aren't our bodies and we aren't our minds. We are something that's deeper than that. So that can be adapted. Our, our niche, uh, our personal, in our day program, our niche is sort of um, middle stage dementia, but it can be adapted to every stage. It just becomes smaller. Um, as you know, this, it's the same quality as, you know, the, 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 the raindrop has the same essence as the whole ocean, you know, so that it's that philosophy, it just takes, you know, the whole orchestra to one note. So you the experience becomes smaller and narrowed, but no less important for someone in closer to end stage. Thanks. And then just as a, a very quick follow up in terms of understanding, you mentioned before about how to um, 
other organizations might just look to apply what works for them and what um, what is useful, what they find um, you know useful to them to their own program. So to find out more is with that um, information on how to apply this or how um, how it all kind of fits together, would that be in the, the book? It's fully explained. Our philosophy is fully explained in the book. Um, the spirit-centered care is fully explained. Our day program is explained, and the you know how it changes with the level of care. The, uh, yeah, so it's in the book, and it's going to be available in July first in our online teaching program. The first course will be an overview course, but we have about ten more lined up that we hope to um, have available later. Thank you. And then let's see. Maybe one or two more questions. Yeah, it looks like actually we have one more question. Um, that is a, a Katie Sheila kind of question. So this is a um, an organization that wants to know a little bit more about um, uh, maybe for lack of better better term, like kind of best practices in reaching an underserved community, whether it be uh, cultural, linguistic, uh, socioeconomic, um, gender, sexuality. Both of you have mentioned different lessons in terms of maybe helping out with other issues that are related, but so they can focus on the caregiving. Or um, also, I think Sheila mentioned building trust. Do you have any um, kind of additional advice for some organizations who are looking to to work on their outreach to these um, some of these communities that seem to have were uh, less access to it programs. Sure. Uh, are, you, are you going, Katie? I didn't know if no, you, <laughs> you can go first. Okay, so um, I would say um, you know, of course, outreach is key. Making sure that whatever material that you use and whatever language you're using is appropriate for whom you're targeting. Um, I would say. You have to be creative with the outreach that you're using. We use uh, social media. We use print ads in magazines and um, newspapers that are specific to the population that we're targeting. Um, we do different presentations. We open up. We have a resource fair that we have monthly that will um, target specific um populations that we are, are looking to serve and we bring in other organizations, right, that align with what we're trying to do. So when a person attends, they're not learning only about our organization, but other organizations that will be able to assist. Um, our staff, they're always getting training to be able to serve those that we are targeting. Um, but I mean, the key thing is just keep going. You have to build the trust. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to, to meet them where they are. So I would say that would be the, the key thing. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, you know, I think one of the ways that we do that is by, you know, um, this was easier um, pre-pandemic, but really going in person to be at, you know, you know different community centers that, um, that serve the populations that you're looking to help the, you know, places of worship, um, pharmacies and other, you know, and doctor's offices, medical centers um, in your community. I think those are you know, really great ways to, to connect with potential caregivers. Um, so just, you know, what population, you know, you're trying to connect with, you know, where are they going for those kind of services? Um, and, you know, connecting with the professionals there, but, you know, going in person and trying to, to meet potential caregivers in person is really, um, uh, uh, it, when you can do it, <laughs> that's, that's the best way. Right. Uh, I, Calvin, I'm going to jump in just really quickly. I know there's probably more questions for folks and, and uh, uh, sadly we've, uh, we've met our time limit, but um, we will have, uh, there is information on the uh, family caregiver website uh, uh, with um, uh, about the awardees. Uh, this year and in past years. And the digital scrapbook on the caregiver website will be updated uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, it'll have contact information um, where you could contact each of these um, wonderful presenters uh, for, for more information uh, with um, about specific questions that you might have. So um, Calvin, let me turn it back to you. 
Well, thanks, Leah, um, and thanks everybody for joining us today for spending your afternoon. We know um, you're all very busy, whether you're a caregiver or a provider, professional. Um, so we do appreciate that. The um, FCA webinars, they're free, they're a continuing series. You can find out more about our webinars on our website, caregiver.org. And I'd like to thank and congratulate again all our guests, Katie, Sandy, Fabiana, Sheila, Tessa, all their fantastic organizations, their great programs, um, and for spending their time with us today. Um, one more thing before, sorry, yes, Leah? No, I was just saying that there was a, some responses going back, and maybe we'll leave uh, the, the site up just a, a, a little webinar up just for a minute or two longer so people can get answers to their questions, that's all. Sure. Yeah. If any of um, the speakers uh, have a moment, I know based on your uh, time zone, you're either getting ready for lunch or the, the afternoon workload. But yeah, if you're able to um, hang on, that'd be great and answer chats. Otherwise, I know everybody's very busy. Um, but I would like to get a quick uh, poll up for the um, attendees so they can uh, give us a little feedback, see how we did. But again, thank you, everybody. Okay. And um, thanks to all our presenters and congratulations again.